welcome to AIL TV. It is Friday night. I know we are shifting. Normally we have this program every Thursdays. You might have noticed that yesterday we didn't have a, a program for various reasons. But as always, when something hap like this happens, we know we have got something very good in store for you. So, as always, today, I'm sure of this evening, it's already evening. Or wherever, if you are in America, of course, it is today, daylight. If you're in Australia, it is another day. Now, we, we normally talk about issues that are affecting Africa. And we have always endeavored to bring experts on the program, actually, to give you the ins and outs of what is going on in Africa, whether it is terrorism, whether it is internal conflicts, and today we are talking about Ethiopia and Ivory Coast. And as always, I'm going to hand you over to David Otto, the founder of Stepped In, Step Out. So, David, what do you have for today? Uh, yes, um, uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Joseph Otieno. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, hosting us on this platform, Africans in London Television. Um, we really want to appreciate uh, our audience for uh, their followership, um, but, but more importantly for their continuous engagement in, in ensuring that we, uh, we come up with the best of um, you know, security updates from Africa. We have been following their advice in terms of which areas to focus on. And as Mr. Joseph said, we have uh, uh, decided to focus today on two very important uh, countries. Um, of course, um, uh, Ethiopia is one of them, which is the uh, second most uh, populous nation in, in Africa. Uh, we would also um, discuss uh, the issues that are ongoing in the elections or the post-election era in, in, in Ivory Coast or Cote d'Ivoire, as my colleague wants us to always call it. So um, uh, thank you very much again, uh, our guest, for the, all the questions that you sent. I, I think let us... Um, before I introduce you to my guest, um, but the experts that I invited today, um, you know, there has been an on ongoing uh, a conflict, I call it, or a battle. Um, the, um, you know, Amnesty International has described it as, as a massacre in, in a region uh, called Tigray, which is uh, the northern part of Ethiopia, just, just very close upwards towards um, uh, Eritrea, and on your, um, I think towards the northeast, you have uh, Sudan within that region. Now, most of you would know that Ethiopia is a federal uh, system of governance. So, um, you know, a lot of these regions, they govern themselves. So there is a current uh, battle, uh, which, you know, has been going on for the past 10 days. And um, the, um, the, the prime minister of, of Ethiopia, um, Abiy uh, Ahmed, who recently um, was awarded a Nobel Peace Prize, um, you know, um, is, is currently at, at, the, at the thick of this um, after there has been the suspension of, of the elections that were supposed to take place. Uh, the elections were suspended, uh, obviously because of the um, ongoing uh, COVID-19 uh, situation. And, um, you know, that has generated a a crisis with the uh, northern part of Ethiopia, which is um, the Tigray region. And what has happened is that um, the Tigray region, the Tigray region decided to carry out its own election. And, um, you know, some, some specialists say to you that that is part of the problem. Others say that is just a consequences of the current issue. Um, but what we know uh, when I bring my guest, is that there is an ongoing battle between the, uh, the Tigrayan People's Liberation Army and the, uh, and the federal um, uh, Ethiopian forces. Um, and that has led to a huge amount of displacement uh, by uh, people. Uh, they, they are moving towards um, Eritrea. Some of them are going towards Sudan. And, um, you know, it's, it's a chaos. You know, it's an ongoing battle. And... Um, uh, we, we really want to get into the thick of this and, and really understand uh, what is going on in this region. You know, so I, I had today uh, two very important guests uh, that I'll bring uh, to talk about this. 
um, and then talk about the um, uh, the situation in um, in Ivory Coast as well, which is a post electoral crisis uh, between the um, you know the the incumbent um, uh, president um, Alassane Ouattara and um, you know the opposition party, the opposition coalition, which declared um, you know some form of transitional government and have been arrested. So we'll get to um, you know the details of that. And, and see where we are, and ask the, the key question, you know, why is Africa always in the thick of insecurity? We've seen uh, the situation that is happening now in, in Ethiopia, which, which is the house of the African Union headquarters. You know, one would wonder that a country like Ethiopia should be the, the example for the rest of Africa you know, in terms of peace and security. And, and that is one of the reasons why, um, in my opinion, the, you know, the, the, the current Prime Minister, Abiy Ahmed, was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, you know, for uh, bringing peace. So what has gone wrong in Ethiopia? What is going on in Africa? If Nigeria is having insecurity because of Boko Haram or because of the current NSAS movement, and then we have the second most populous country in Africa also having a serious crisis. What is the fate of Africa coming when we talk about the oncoming uh, 2021? So I have my guest uh, with me today is uh, Mr. Alex uh, Behanu, who is, uh, you know, a, a, a lecturer, a researcher. Uh, Mr. Alex Behanu wrote a book known as Few Dictators, a Liberal Rebel, uh, Discourses on Economic Democracy. So I would, you know, want to talk to him, um, you know, and then before I, I, I speak, uh, Mr. Alex Akoman, who is uh, a certified anti-terrorism specialist and a political risk analyst with a very deep knowledge of what is going on in Ivory Coast. So, um, uh, Mr. Alex Bahanu, welcome uh, to the show. Um, you know, I, I, I want to get you in. You know, give us a bit of, of, of your own understanding of why this going conflict uh, between uh, the uh, federal forces of Ethiopia and the, um, the, the um, you know, the, 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 the Tigray People's Liberation Movement, which, you know, is in the north of the country. What is going on? How did this begin? Firstly, thank you for having me. And very many thanks for organizing such a uh, program. It's, it's a letting and it's a it's gratifying to find out that there are brothers are concerned about our continent. And I really, really appreciate your good work. Having said so, now I'll straight jump to the, the very question we are going to discuss. It's very difficult where to start. Anyway, I'll try to give you a bird's eye view of what is, what's going on in Ethiopia. As you well know, Ethiopia has been run and ruled by a military junta for about 17 years, which ended up by four fronts led by the CPLF in 1991. This coalition has been running and introducing new economic systems, new political systems. One of the political systems introduced Ethiopia was federal system which accommodates, which accommodates all the nationalities and nations, tribes or clans, having equal say and equal economic benefit out of the economic system. This was running well for, for 17 years, for almost two decades. But unfortunately, the federal system has been misunderstood and misconstrued by the elites from the majority and the, by, elites, by the elites of the previous ruling uh, group. The majority elite group thinks that federalism is not in such a way that everybody equal, gets equal benefit, but only the majority. But in truth, federal system is a system which brings into equal power minorities so that they benefit together, they benefit mutually, but contribute as much as they can. If you can see my hand, my finger, uh, can you see it? Yes, I can see that, yes. Or, 
Yeah, you can see your own hands. They are of different height, of different size. They all consume, you know, according to their size. But they work together. If you use, you know, if you, if you use a pen, they use to get, they work together. Even the small finger needs to be involved, you know, to have a proper writing. It comes only equal when they are dead, inactive. You can fold them and see how equal they are. Okay? Yes. The majority ethnic group which are named as Oromo, because they are the majority, they want the upper hand of the state machinery. The Amhara, the second elite, who have been running the Ethiopian polity for the last 400 years, they want to retain their previous glory. But the, the coalition led by TPLF said, no, federalism means to take everyone as equal partner and work together, contribute as much as we could, you know, depending on our economic and population size, democratic size. And then when an enemy comes to stand together and retain our sovereignty by fighting out an external enemy. Otherwise, we all lead and manage, administer our localities, use our languages, have our own parliament, have respective flags, have respective, you know, defending me mechanism. The Tigrayans never forced anyone to use their language, to eat their bread, to, to dress like the Tigrayans, nor to enjoy their music. They allow every other ethnic minority to enjoy their own culture, their own language, even to have their own parliament, even to have their own flag, and to administer their own people in the way they fit, they seem fit, provided they stay within the federation, provided they don't need any help from the central government, they can run without any intervention from the center. This is what the TPLS has fought for, to lead, manage, administer their own people without undue interference from the center, which has been running for the last 2000 years, you can say even. But unfortunately, this was not settled out and sink down elites. And the TPLF, quite frankly, was excluding some of the elites. Not only the Amharas and even the Tigrayans from their own tribe or nationality, they were very skeptical and very cautious. So that no one would hamper their aim, their vision, their uh, the, the plan they had to fight poverty and break development in the way they wanted it. But the Amhara is sensitive, and uh, unlike the Tigrayans, I personally was excluded from the, the PLFs, you know, when we try to suggest something, what they should do and what they should not do. They would think, who the hell is he? Because I used to a national party. In like manner, the Amhara felt, you know, so excluded, firstly. Secondly, PLF led economic policy introduced by the late Prime Minister Melles, then who was my schoolmate. He had tried hard to kill poverty once and for all. In this line, before he took over, we had only one university, but after he took over, we have now 45 universities. No country in the world has made such progress in such a short time. Unfortunately, this has brought its own problem. We have so many graduate youngsters, and, but the economy could not absorb them. When they yeah. see the economy is not absorbing them, when they became idle and unemployed, they start to ask the local administration in their respective regions, but they couldn't answer. And instead, they were telling them, look, this has been taken over by the PLF. This has been owned by the PLF. This has been, you know, run by the PLF. We can't, we couldn't help you. Yeah, L L let me, let me, let, 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 yeah, Ms. Alex, let me, let, let me ask you something, because this is very important. You mentioned some very, very key points here, especially 
going back to some of the underlying um, uh, uh, causes of the current uh, conflict, uh, the current, uh, you know, what, what I can call it, a war, you know, a civil war. Now, what really triggered the fighting that has been going on for 10 days? What triggered it? What specifically triggered it? Okay. I was heading to that. This is why I'm speaking fast, you know, so that I can reach, you know, to your question you are waiting. But unless you know the background, the of basis course. of the war, you wouldn't understand this. So just to continue what I had started, you remember, let me to bring you to your attention when uh, Haile Gebrselassie won the London Marathon. You remember? Yes. He was ahead of the Kenyan guy. The Kenyan guy beat him on the back. In a race, you don't trick or treat your competitor. You try to catch up and pass him, isn't it? In a capitalism, is throat cutting competition. Capitalism introduces competition, not complementarity. In this instance, when Mellis liberalized the economy, few people, not few people, a substantial number of millionaires have come out. And the other tribes, the majority, and the, the one the previously who were ruling the country think that CPLF or Tigrans are benefiting out of it, okay, through corruption. If you take corruption, and if you take the prisoners in, uh, in, this, in the prison, you know, if 1,000 prisoners who have been in prison for corruption, the percentage of Tigrans out of this corruption will be 6% corresponding to their population size. If at all they have used the state machinery, Let's say it is 12%, okay? But mm. the 80, 82% are from the center or from the previous, you know, ruling group or from the majority, as this can tell you. This economic competition created economic rift between more have nots and a few millionaires. And I say that this is on Ethiopian television as well as in another media. If each region could accommodate the youngsters, give them job, create jobs by expanding the industrial, uh, the industrial innovation by introduced by Mellis, and if they could expand the economy into other sectors like tourism, like transport, like uh, and improve the farming system, many youngsters would be absorbed, and this question of jealousy in quotation wouldn't arise. So with this situation, what happened is Dobin has sh was shaken, and somehow, some way, Abiy came to power. He was part and parcel of the coalition. He was selling, you know, out information to the rebels in Eritrea, but somehow, the Tigrans thought, okay, fine, if you're going to reform it and bring change and to modify what has been done, fine, we will leave the job, and they left their region. One psychological thing let me bring you. The Tigrans are known for being flared, you know, with simple things they could uh, stand up to fight. But this has been subdued and sublimated and adopted the central way of thinking, being calm and cool. Okay? Have they been, you know, the same, you know, with the same attitude, with the mentality? When they were chased out from the center, they would have started war. They didn't. Roads were blocked going to Tigray. They didn't shoot anything and they didn't say anything. They only appealed the rule of law should be maintained. So the present war, I wouldn't think at all that the TPLF would start it. When the Tigrayans were chased, many killed in other parts of the region, especially in the Amhara region, they didn't shoot anything, they didn't say anything, they only appealed to the center to uphold rule of law. So this war, on the ground, I can't tell you who has initiated, but 
definite with with um, full confidence, I can give you derivative factors. The Tigran's culture is anyone who knows that he will win a war or a fight never initiates. This is this psyche, this psychological thing is even shared by other Africans. They wait to let the weaker one to provoke. Okay. Yeah. So in, in other words, in other conclude. words, yes. Go ahead. So in in other words, um, what you're saying is the, the war was not started by the by the Trigrians. You know, it was started by by other parties. I wish I could give you the facts on the ground, but I don't have. But from derivative fact statements, I can give you what I was telling you. Roads were blocked. They didn't provoke. They didn't respond. They were chased out of the center. Which critical issue. They should have started fighting in other African countries. When a president or a certain group is chased out, they would fight. They didn't. They know that they have truth beside, beside them. They know that they were not they were as corrupt as they were uh, uh, accused by other by the other groups. And they know that they their people would know what they have been doing. The last 17 years, so much has been you know, done. You have seen it, you have witnessed yourself. So many universities, so many roads, so many infrastructures, so many in, uh, uh, Tedros, uh, Dr. Tedros Adhanomus, you know, innovative work. And about 28% people have come out of the poverty of level. They didn't provoke when they were taken away from the center, okay? Yeah. When the roads were blocked, didn't act. And now, even on the 24th of October, when they told that um, Abi has accused the Tigrans for acting the third division in the northern part of Ethiopia, which was meant to protect, you know, against Eritrea. I wouldn't believe him. He's a pathologic liar. I can tell you how many yeah. lies he has told. Last month, you have heard him say the economy has grown by 6%. Would you believe him? Would anyone believe him? He said Isaiah's Afork is the most peace-loving and uh, democratic who, who cares about it. Would you believe him? Yeah. He said, so let me... I will me not... Yes, Ms. Alex, let me let me go to uh, my colleague uh, Alex, you know, your your, your fellow um, uh, panelists as well, so that I can get back to you. And and I want you to think about um, some of the uh, the regional implications um, while I'm talking to Alex, because there's there's um, that there is an international support um, that is coming on from uh, maybe because of the uh, uh, the the credit. Um, Ethiopia has with uh, with Egypt or Sudan with the uh, with the dam. I'm sure you know about that. So look at some of the external um, uh, accusations that are coming in that foreign countries are supporting uh, the Trigrian region to fight against the Ethiopians. So I'll come back to you on that. But you know, um, okay. Mr. Alex, okay. you know, you, you've heard what a um, uh, uh, colleague uh, uh, Bahanu has said. You know, from your experience in Africa and your experience in, with what is going on in. In in um, in Ivory Coast, uh, in Cote d'Ivoire, it is the same um, kind of uh, political trajectory that um, you know uh, you know deals with uh, different political parties and different ethnic groups. Now we have a situation where um, <coughs> you know the the president has um, has has talked to the fact that he's won the election. The opposition is saying that um, they have formed an uh, a transition government. You know what is what is going on now, Alex, on the ground. What is your uh, what is going on? You know what is your perspective on what is going on at the moment? Right. Thank you, David, and also thank you the other panelists from Ethiopia, which is a great country, and I have a lot of friends from Ethiopia as well. Now, in Cote d'Ivoire, we should not have experienced what we're going through, but it's because of the fact that the incumbent president refused to respect the law, which is the constitution of the country. He's not allowed to run for a third term. And he agreed, has been saying that for a few years. But uh, recently, in, um, 
August, on the 6th of August, he made a speech saying that he's going to run for election. And since the 7th, the country has been in a turmoil because you know, everyone wants to have the law of the country respected, especially when it comes to the constitution. The opposition parties asked and uh, requested discussions with the incumbent president and the incumbent president just ignore whatever the position we're looking for until the elections dates arrived, which was on the 31st of October. On the 31st of October, there were already uh, civil disobedience words and all the opposition members across the country were trying to disrupt the election process. On that day, made based on various reports, less than 10 people, 10% 10 of the population attend the polling stations. That means that within the Ivorian law, this election should have just been annulled. Secondly, there are violence and across the country, since that day, since the 31st of October, we've seen violence across the country. And when we look at where the violence is coming from, it's basically the authorities who have militia and the armed the militia groups with um, machetes. And these uh, militia groups are sometimes transported by the government um, buses and coaches, and they go and attack peaceful civilian protesters. So this has been going on for the last few days, and especially this week, things went very, very bad, went worse. We had killings in different um, towns, and in only one town in the eastern part of the country, we had even over 34 people killed in just one town. That's what the 10th of November. So the international organizations and international authority diplomats started to negotiate. And we had the first meeting between the incumbent president who has now been who's been out of power and the opposition leader because the opposition party based on the fact that the president's mandate finished on the 31st of December of October but decided to put in a place a transitional government to take over and run the country and the president decided to arrest all the opposition leaders and block and put um, a blockage around the leader of the opposition, which is the former president, Konabedie. So the 11th, after the killing, the killings of, we're talking about around over 100 killing, over people lost their life and more than around 500 people who are being injured. The two leaders met on the 11th for a brief discussions. And President Bedier made it clear that this was just a first contact because for months they've been asking Watra to have a meeting with them so that we can discuss all the issues relating to the election, but what I refused. Even the African Human Rights Court decision made and asking the government to put in place regulations and systems can be fair to have election. The president, the former president refused. So now we're having all the opposition party who've been arrested and after the meeting on the 11th, the position has only the same things they 
put on the table since the beginning, which are to free all the political prisoners. And let me tell you that since the 2011th coup, which put Watra in power, we still have political prisoners who have been detained since 2011. We have in the neighboring countries exiled Ivorian because of a political turmoil from 2011. Yeah, so I, 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 yeah, yeah you, you, you're making a very good point, Alex. Sorry to interrupt you there. Now, who, who gave these instructions? Who gave these, um, uh, these conditions for the release of all the political prisoners? Is this, is this an agreement between uh, the, um, the opposition and the uh, Alassane Ouattara government? Right, okay. The, after, the first, after the meeting on, when, on, on the 11th, Watra is now willing to discuss with the opposition parties. And the opposition okay. parties reiterated the, the, what they asked already, that all the political prisoners, some been arrested and detained since 2011, some just been arrested this, the last few days because of the opposition activities. So now the position is made in clear that for a discussion to take place between the opposition and Watara, Watara should release all the political prisoners. Watara should allow the return, of, we're talking about over 50,000 Ivorians spread across different countries in Africa. Watara should allow the former president, Laurent Gbagbo, who has been acquitted from the Hague court to return and also all the other Ivorian who have been forced to leave the country because of a political situation have to be returning home safely and secured. From then, they will be having a discussion between the opposition and Watara's camp. And as we and, stand, and do you think, and, and, and so, and Mr. Alex, do you think this is something that... Uh... Uh, the um, uh, the Wataras government will likely approve of. Uh, uh, I'll give you one minute to talk about that, and I'll get to uh, um, uh, Alex uh, Banhanu. Obviously, Watara is no longer the president of Cote d'Ivoire because she is not allowed to run for a third term, and his second term, the mandate ended on the thirty first of October. So, as we speak, Watara is no longer the legitimate leader of the country. And he has to ensure that something is done, power to be handed over. And this is the we are in now. So he himself is not the one holding power to say what you need to do or what needs to be done. There is a need for both groups to discuss. If every group wants the benefit, they want the country to move forward, then they need to talk and agree on things to be done for the peace, for peaceful resolution of the conflict. So, yeah. so it's, it's, yeah, we know that we're going through a difficult time and um, Watras, Watras army has already killed over 100 people, and there is a lot of tension in the country. And as we yeah. know, we cannot have a country where the leader of the president is the one who is violating the law of the country. So this is where we are now. And the next few days and few weeks, the discussion will continue between Watra and the opposition so that we hopefully I mean, we don't have a timetable yet, but uh, within a reasonable time, we will reach a peaceful conclusion. Yeah, I'll, I'll come back to you, Alex, especially um, on uh, uh, on talking about the, um, uh, the the role that X is supposed to be playing. We've talked about that on, on several occasions. Uh, let me get to uh, Alex uh, uh, Behanu. Um, uh, Mr. Alex Behanu, we, we have the... Uh, the, the Prime Minister of Ethiopia accusing uh, foreigners, foreign nations of supporting uh, the Tigrayi People's Liberation uh, Movement. And uh, 
um, and, and there are talks about issues of the, um, you know, maybe support coming from 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 Egypt or or, or Sudan because of the existing, um, you know, tensions that are existing uh, because of the the Grand Renaissance Dam. I'm sure you are aware that uh, there is a there is a tension between Ethiopia, Sudan, uh, and Egypt on that dam. You know, do, do you see this as a possibility, um, or, or this is just being uh, you know, uh, the, the, the Ethiopian government is masking this in the, in the real issues that you've mentioned. W what is the truth about this from your experience? Absolutely white lie. Never. The great dam, the, Renaissance, the great Renaissance dam is the project of the TPLF. The great dam, Renaissance dam is a project of the late prime minister. The, le the great Renaissance Dam was built by the blood of the TPLF. That was the first measure, their project. Their, this is their, la their history mark, historical mark. Their, this is the historical seal they put for centuries to come. This is why, why Abiji wants to demolish. Even he boasted. He took even the most dictator known Isaiah to them, dumb, who opposed the dumb, saying TPLF is doing this to show off its political clout. It was something rubbish which he said, you know, 20 years ago. Now he dared, he had the gut to go and see it. And Abiji, I have told you already how pathological liar he is. Okay, Egyptians are happy that the TPLF is out of the political game the last two years. Tigranes have been surrounded by TPLF, by some federalists and some of the Amhara region who were rivalers for many years. No country likes to support them. That's lie. The only support they have is their aim, their truth, the truth and just for just a war they they fight for justice. And their diaspora support them. The little support they get is from the diaspora. Of course, in 1981, 1983, up to 1991, they had a support from many in, in a, and the Jews because of the Cold War. But there is no Cold War now. Everybody is struggling, you know, for its own survival, thanks to Corona pandemic. If he had said, you know, say the Kenyans are supporting, you can find out. The Kenyans are not supporting them at all. Egyptians, that is laughable. No one would believe him at all. I told okay, you, no. many economists in the world know that how he lied last, last month to the parliament. The Ethiopian economy is growing by 6%, he said. Who would believe him? Let, let me, let me okay. get back to you, uh, 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 Mr. Alex, because uh, Joseph wants to ask the question. Mr. Joseph, go ahead. Yes, uh, th th this question is for, for Alex Bar Barhanu. You know, many people, many African people, are proud of Ethiopia for one reason, because they say Ethiopia is the country which has never been colonized. But when you put, when you look at the countries uh, which has been colonized by the West, are having similar problems. Even, even no, Ethiopia is even having more problems than those countries that were colonized by uh, by the Europeans. So what went wrong here, Mr. Baram Bahanu? Um, as I tried to explain, you know, previously, for the last 500 years was led, managed, administered by the Amhara elite. Not the Amhara people, the poor miss, but the Amhara elite, which, in, you know, up to Haile Selassie, even up to the Dirk, it was the Amharan uh, way of managing. But the Tigrans 
have been subdued to the center by bombardment of Haile Selassie, helped by the British you know, Air Force in 1941. This rivalry for power has been going on for all, for that period, starting uh, from even 100 years ago. Okay? Ethiopia has never addressed the political issue, the political issues pertaining to power sharing. What we had up to, up to the emperor was appointed by God, in quotation, and then the Dirk appointed by Gan. When they came, they said, let's forget this unitary, unified, one person, one government, one, uh, you know, government, one ethnic ruling and imposing way of, you know, administration. Instead, let's administer our locality. Let's run the affairs of our regions. But let's meet at the center when it comes to big issues like an invader coming or economic policy, educational matters, and budget allocation. Otherwise, the rest should be run by our respective regions, which is very good. Everybody was happy, I told you, for the last 17 years. And we have seen the effect. So many universities were abused. It because every region had its own you know, right to improve its own region, to build schools, roads, whatnot. But when we had so many youngsters educated coming out of the university, there was no economy. The economy was not developed enough to absorb that. So when they asked for employment, for job, for bread, their respective elites and leaders they point their fingers to the PLF because they were the dominant one. They almost, because of their majority, they want to run the machinery, the state apparatus. And the Amhara, because they were ruling, they want to bring back their glory. But in a federal system, that's not the way it works. If I can, if you allow me further, you know, to explain what federalism means in the American point of view, Los Angeles, California has got the highest population. And Hano, uh, now, uh, Hawaii has got the least. Texas has got the largest area. And Wayne has got the smallest. But each state in the United States are represented by two people. And in the Ethiopian case, the major, part, the, the major tribes were represented by nine, nine, nine individuals at the federal house. And on equal footing, that means. Of course, some minorities were excluded, which was wrong, which we point out to the PLF or to the PRDF you know, leadership at that time. But those who have been already involved within, within the coalition, they lost nothing. They had full right to develop, to bring up the economy system of their respective regions. They didn't. They, all they wanted was to grab the saddle of power. This is why we have the same problem now and again. Every individual elite, every politician come to power, doesn't care about the people, but about his power, about his name, about his authority, to show off his muscle, to exercise his muscle over the others. Okay, if so Mr. Bahani, Mr. Alex, uh, just, just a minute. Yeah, uh, this is... Uh, this is a question that I want to ask, and you have to answer it very quick, because we need we are okay. coming to the end of the of our program now, where we have got about fifteen minutes. But do you see any changes? Do you see any change or things will change in Ethiopia since every tribe wants to rule or to govern by itself? Do you really see anything changing in the near future? I do. Because it has shown you know, already how effective it is in the last 70, uh, 27 years. Somalian had their own parliament. Uh, let me tell you a fact which I know well of. The Somalians were, when Meles came to power, when he was elected prime minister, the Somalian asked him to secede to the greater Somalia. He said, okay, you have the right to secede. You can use the article 39 in our federal uh, constitution, but why allow us, give us the benefit of doubt, 
that we can do good for you. If you're not happy with us, you have the right to say it. And they waited, they said, they had their own budget, they had their own flag, they had their own parliament, they had their own educational system. They were happy. The, uh, the, the small minority, even in Harris, they were happy. They had their own flag, their own parliament, their own economic system. And the Oromo as well. Even the Oromo, look, they abandoned the Ethiopian alphabet, which they should be proud of, which other Africans are trying to uh, use and learn. They use even a Latin letter to this extent to show their resentment against the, the established system, you know, the previous established system. They had their own parliament, they had their own leaders, they had their own president. And now even they want to impose, you know, their language, which TPLF didn't do. TPLF allowed every tribe has to exercise its own right, its own culture, its own administration. And this has been going on and has shown its fruition has been still, you know, in the in the eyes and hearts of the minorities. And I'm pretty sure yeah. sooner or later it will come back. If if Abiy had understood the polity, the Ethiopian polity, how it could be resolved, you know, the power issue, and if he if he knew how to play the card, the political card, this disaster wouldn't have come at all. Yeah, I, I, that's a very good point. Um, uh, I'm going to get to Ali. Um, let me finish with you, um, uh, uh, Mr. Alex Bahanu. Uh, now people have been killed, and there's been a state of emergency that has been declared by the lower house of uh, assembly, uh, uh, you know, in the region of uh, uh, the Tigray region. Um, you know, the, the, the Ethiopian uh, prime minister is saying we will finish the war uh, very... Uh, in your opinion, uh, and, and, and I think, you know, I just want to give you one minute for this. In your opinion, what is the short-term answer to this war? You know, if you were called upon to give your advice, what would you say is the solution in the short term now that the war is ongoing? One, to stop all the war, not the physical war even, the media war, lies, lies, lies. If they stop that one, the next would follow. And secession from all physical war. Second, to help those who are stranded. Third, to invest, to appoint an independent body from Africans to investigate the constitution, A, B, to define what flag means, C, to define what federation means, four, to be a relation with the um, the Ethiopian government relation with Eritrea. Five, the Grand Dam's status, present status. Where is it? Is it under, under the, is it flouting or is flattering? This has to be studied by an independent body. Six, the last one, <coughs> who triggered the last war last week? Is it TPLF or Abiy's government? This has to be investigated and find out by an independent African body without involving anyone else, but African body, the OU. But unfortunately, the OU itself is have been crippled, you know, by Abiy. I heard today, right now, an hour ago, the OU has been asked to fire all the Tigrians. Another genocide, another inter Hamway, another genocide is coming to Tigray, to Ethiopia. Unless we stop this one now, all of you, unless you use this media to stop the killing nothing will happen. Please do focus on stopping the war, the media war as well as the physical war. And I can't implore you more to air out this in every possible way to stop another genocide, another inter within our continent. And thank you for your effort for so far. Uh, thank you, Mr. Alex, for that. I mean, that's a very clear message. Um, the needs to stop um, the, you know, the uh, uh, both sides need to meet up and and have a a, a solution that is going to be long lasting. We don't want to see um, another genocide. We don't want to see another massacre of Africans. Uh, we have we have come a very long way, and we want to um, move ahead. Now, uh, Mr. Alex, you know you've heard what um, uh, Mr. Alex Bahanu has said. In you know how we need to uh, have Africans to intervene in the issues of Africa. You know, in, in your opinion, I mean, is is you know, it, it, you know, is the African Union is it time for the African Union to in, intervene 
in what is in Africa's now, or do you think ECOWAS is doing a good job? Uh, you know, what's your thought on this, Alex? Yeah, thank you. Uh, the, the, I think um, over the last few years, 10 years or, or more, the other institutions, especially the ECOWAS and even the African Union, have not been efficient in dealing with issues in Africa. If you look at what's happening in Cote d'Ivoire right now, we have the African Human Rights Court in Tanzania who made decisions asking the Ivorian authorities to respect certain certain line in terms of ensuring that the electoral commissions is fair and also ensuring that people receive a voting card people ensure, ensure that security is the country before they organize elections but the government blatantly refused to listen to what the court has decided and they decided to even withdraw the country from the African institution, even though, you know, the decision of the, of the court is still applied with for the next 12 months. And this president, according to the country's constitution, the constitution he agreed, he respected for three years and the last few months before the second of the for him to hand over power and leave office of his two mandates, suddenly decided to go back and change everything he said. So he put the country in a turmoil. And ECOWAS unfortunately cannot, because we've seen ECOWAS um, envoy in Ivory Coast once or twice to come and negotiate. And they do not have the clout. They do not have the know-how, or maybe they are not free enough to be able to use go, the legal, the legal, uh, the legal um, framework. Yeah. To put to the president to say, look. First of all, your own, I mean, any any country, everyone has to respect the law of the country. But if this is a country where the first person to break the law is the, is the president. So diplomatically, all these ECOWA um, officials should have been able to remind Watara of his ability not to break the law. But they were not even able to do that. Second, yeah. the, the, the African court decision should have been re respected I mean, him so that he can respect it. And he has not respected. As a result, we're having that conflict right now. And the opposition has been asking discussion, which he refused because he said on the 16th of October, what am I going to, to tell them? Even though he knew that this is not a fair election which is coming on. Now, after the death of over 100, the position is still pushing for reforms to be done before we talk about election, because he, as an individual, is no longer allowed to run for the third term. OK, let me, let me ask you, let me ask you, let me come, yeah, let me come to, to you again, uh, uh, Alex. Let me finish with you, because, you know, in, in 2002, um, you know, you wrote uh, an article on the uh, the magazine with a vision for Africa, in which you said, um, "Ivory Coast, uh, a peace at what cost?" So, uh, at what cost, um, in your opinion, is peace going to return to Ivory Coast and, and, and Africa in general? In Africa in general, I mean, some African countries are doing well. It's only very few countries where we still have issue of people not abiding by the law. Now, for us to be able to present ourselves as mature people, res responsible enough to run our countries, we need to respect the law. 
because this is how a community can progress. We don't need to expect a foreign party to come and tell us what to do. And unfortunately, especially for what's happened in Cote d'Ivoire in 2011, and it's happening today, it's because the law of the country is not respected. So we, we still need to have maybe a different African body who will be really active and will really be efficient and do things as, as it should be done. Because it's, it's almost it's laughable when you look at the African institutions, African Union itself and, Afri and, and ECOWAS. In 2011, African Union did not say anything when the foreign forces were coming to Libya. And even though Libya was a member of the African Union, foreign forces came to Libya and destroyed Libya. And after 10 years, look at how Libya is now. So there is a, a, there is a need for new leaders to maybe come up and also the thinking of Africa need to be changed. The way we see, we see things, we need to reconsider ourselves. Africa was the cradle of, the, of this world, and all these scientific discoveries were made in Africa. And we led the world, we guided the world through all these institutions. All these institutions known across the world was created in Africa. But yeah. we are in the first millennium, and African countries most African countries, not all of them, some are doing well as us, but some African countries is still lacking behind. And we need to go back to maybe our own ways of doing things and try and take control and make our things more progress. Yeah, uh, I thank, thank, thank you very much for that, uh, Mr. Alex Akoban. I, I just want to give uh, one minute more to uh, Alex Bahanu because um, I, I understand that the uh, the, the, the TPLM, you know, is is not a is not a weak force, and you know, um, in in putting an argument for the cessation of violence, um, um, would you be advising the Ethiopian uh, federal forces to, uh, to 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 consider that this is not a conflict that can be won um, simply trying to fight against the TPLM it is. Is that one of the, uh, the, the, the strategies that you, uh, you know, could influence both parties to sit on the table, knowing fully well that this war cannot be won in the field? Um, I tell you, the TPLF were the founders of Tigray, the Ethiopia Empire. They never, never thought of secession. The Eritreans were forced to secede. They were part and parcel of the Tigrans. They are Tigrans by, by, by blood, by identity. They only have a political citizenship as Eritreans. But the government we have now in power is not even as nationalist as Colonel Mangisto Haile Mariam, who is uh, residing in Zimbabwe. He was really nationalist, Mangisto. But this guy is Rufian, vagabond, liar, who has no any any inclination of love of the country or the people. He tells something and somewhere and he tells something else. He says we are not supporting you know the secession. They have never raised any question of secession. They say they want to maintain federalism, which takes which accommodates all nationalists and all kinds of things. That's it. And to respect the law of the rule of law, to respect the constitution. The constitution may need to be Rectify, fair enough, but not to annul altogether. You don't throw the baby with the bath water. Yeah. The constitution is what makes the country going, you know, in any country. Okay? The constitution yes. has all the provisions to bring democratic and equal footing for all minorities. That's what makes it different. Of course, in a Western political view, it may it may seem you know it, it it's not you know as democratic as we we know it, but to me, as I said it in my book, the first economic, the the first democracy, human democracy, economic democracy. If everybody has got equal share, equal fair, you know, a portion of the cake, 
That's what I call democracy. But yeah. our democracy in the continent has been disrupted, blundered by Western capitalists. Not all capitalists, Western you know, people, I don't mean, capitalists from the West. And the capitalism is make money at the cost of your brother or sister. This is what we have to fight. We have to have the, our you. economic system. This is what yeah. Mellis introduced, development, developmental state. The state right. where it would have a right to exercise economic rights, economic policies, at the same time, maintain the sovereignty, at the same time, give democracy to the people to get a fair share of the of the national cake, the national bread. But, and but, but, the TPLF but, never, but, never thought of the thing. It's only yeah. to have a fair share of its administration, of its of the cake of the country, and to be heard on equal footing. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Alex. Uh, in the center, yeah, thank you. Not to dominate. Yeah, thank you very much. Not to be dominated. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Alex uh, Bahanu, uh, uh, author and uh, uh, and lecturer and researcher, the few dictators, a liberal rebel uh, on economic uh, democracy. I really want to thank you for your views. I uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Alex Akoman, uh, the certified anti-terrorism analyst and the senior analyst for African affairs. You know, we've heard your views. Thank you very we much for organizing Africa... this program. Yes, yes, uh, we you know we would uh, we would we would bring you back again because I think it's important for us to have this conversation. Um, we really want to thank uh, the viewers for all their questions. Thanks to Africans in London Television. Uh, we want to appreciate uh, Mr. Uh, Joseph Ocheno for his continuous engagement. Thank you very much. We would see you again uh, next week um, for the same. Can I suggest something? Program. Yes. Can I suggest something? Can I suggest something? Yes, go ahead. Yes. If you want to get the root matter of this case, Horn of Africa, because Ethiopia is a very critical one for the whole of Africa, why not we invite panelists from every corner of the political spectrum? We would do from that. The Oromo, from the Amha, from Kenyans, and from Sudanese, and from Eritreans as well. You will find the truth, and you will find the root cause for the the present crisis. Thank, thank you very much. We will do that um, uh, next week. We will try and arrange that so that we can get a broad base um, uh, opinion from all these stakeholders. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Alex Bahanu, for that. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Thank Joseph, you. over to you. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, thank you, viewers. There has been a uh, whole lot of comments coming in here. I just want to thank uh, Stephanus. Uh, Bebe, Abebe, for actually has contributed a lot here. His comments, if you want to see what he's been talking about, because we have run out of time, you can go to, to Facebook or YouTube. You will be able to see all these comments as actually been posted. But also one, uh, one thing that we, we didn't touch upon, uh, Mr. Alex ba Bahanu, is an author he's he's written a book maybe next week we will want him to to talk about his book or maybe mr bahanu can you actually just within one minute only can you actually talk slightly about your book please it's about the dictators i studied it for eight years the nature and their characters of dictators what they look like how they have bringing up from Hitler up to Gaddafi and those who have been allegedly you know, accused, including Meles and the rest. And you can find it, you know, now it's, I think it's for four pound on Amazon, which was about 60 pound uh, last month. So you can get it easily. And I don't take a penny out of it. It's all for a charity, for, <coughs> for elderly people center. So if you if, if you get the book, you'll find what I'm talking about. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, thank you, thank, you thank you very much. And until next week, we yes, you've had a whole lot of a whole lot of things. Uh, you've you've got these experts, and now we are really touching an issue that is really affecting Africa. You see, we have been talking about. Uh, 
Cameroon, we have talked about Ivory Coast, we have talked, now we are talking about Ethiopia. But then again, we will also be talking, as it has been suggested, we are planning actually to talk about the Horn of Africa. But we are not only going to look at its political implication, but also we want actually to look at how all these conflicts, they slow down our social and economic uh, 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 forwardness or improvement. And for, on that note, I will see you next week. David Otto will be here again with his, uh, with his special guests. We don't know who is going to be, but uh, as for now, I must say thank you very much for all you guys and whatever you have done. And until then, bye-bye.